Hello and welcome to Healing from Within. I am your host, Cheryl Glick, author of Life is No Coincidence and The Living Spirit, which shares stories of spiritual awakening, communication, healing energies, miracles, and ways to develop and utilize your intuitive wisdom. Today I'm most delighted to welcome back for a second time Mark Treitler, who is the author of Alcohols, Drugs, and You, to share his personal journey of success in dealing with challenges in his own life. Hello, Mark, and thank you for joining us for a second time on Healing from Within. Listeners may go to the radio link of my website, September 2018, at CherylGlick.com, to listen to Mark discuss his first book, Alcoholism is a Disease. Let's treat it. Mark, as listeners of Healing from Within have come to expect over the years, my guests and I share intimate experiences and insights to help us focus on both our energetic essence and physical life situations so we can begin to recognize who we are and how best to create a purposeful, healthy human and spiritual life journey. In today's episode of Healing from Within, Mark Treitler, a successful corporate attorney, loving husband and father, and a recovering alcoholic, shares his tale, his awareness and recovery, initiated by his daughter Leanna. Along with many statistics and information the public needs to know about alcoholism and addiction as a disease, Mark and his daughter Leanna are on a mission to reach kids before they become statistics by learning the facts on the abuse issues associated with alcohol and other substances. Mark, Mark, I always love to ask my guests to think back to their childhood and remember a person, place, event, dream, or thought that was very important to them and may have signaled to them or others the work or interest they would have as an adult. So think back for a minute. I don't know if it goes all the way back to my childhood, but I had a uh, I had a uh, therapist uh, early in my recovery, the first uh, month of my recovery in, uh, in from alcohol, that uh, told me that uh, he felt that I was um, chosen to share this message with others. And he had me buy a little ring that says chosen on it to, uh, to remind <laughs> me of that. So I'm still wearing that ring today, and that, that, uh, that therapist was very uh, spiritual and seemed to know everything about everybody in the room, so I didn't question it. Um, so I think uh, looking back about 10 years, uh, he, 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 was, he, he was very uh, accurate in his prediction. You were very fortunate to be guided to him, and I don't believe that was random either. Because, yes, yeah, I feel that every guest I've done over 700 shows of authors on all different topics relating to both our spiritual life and to our physical life. And I believe we're all brought together uh, to share what our purpose is and um, whatever we've experienced and to help others. So I, I think that's a wonderful story. Excellent. All right, and, yeah. And I know you have the Rosebud Foundation where uh, you and your daughter work to help young people stay alcohol and substance free. So let's get on to tell us something of the pressures that led you to drink excessively and the tools you discovered to deal with stress, peer pressure, and life itself. Because that's a very loaded question. Yeah. You know, I think actually... um Alcoholics, I think they use pressure as an excuse. Mm-hmm. Everybody has pressure in their life. So, real alcoholics, once they uh, once they start drinking, whether like for me it was in college in a fraternity, so it wasn't really pressure. It was just you know that's what I thought college boys did uh, and college men. Um, I- and then once it takes a hold of your uh, your brain and your body in terms of addiction, whether it's alcohol or opiates. Um, then it's very easy to use pressure or marriage 
uh, marriage issues or financial issues or whatever it is, an alcoholic is very good at finding pressures in life uh, to justify the drinking. But really, once that alcoholic uh, light switch is turned on, it doesn't matter if there's pressures or not. You're, until you get better, you're going to drink. Well, absolutely. The outside world is not creating our problems. Everything's coming from within, from our own perceptions, our own traumas, the way we viewed our life as children, and uh, and the trauma we carry within us. So if we can discover that about ourselves and free ourselves of those and see it in a different way, we can create an entirely different package for ourselves. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's my... the truth. It doesn't come from with. You can't blame people for what happens to you, and many people do. But let's go on to you say that in most families, alcohol is a normal part of entertaining. You're going to see your parents serve drinks and observe your parents have a glass of wine or beer, and it becomes a regular part of life. So when you go off to college, you sort of think, now you're grown up, this is something you have to experience. But we have to realize that the potential for some people to take that first drink and become an alcoholic is within their genes. It's almost an allergy. It's almost a reaction. And uh, tell us something about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very true that what you watch your parents do as you're growing up and as you're a teenager, you emulate it whether you like it or not. So like Super Bowl yesterday, how many of your listeners had beer and alcohol with your children around? Um, I didn't. Obviously, I'm in a different place, but I didn't. <laughs> or, yeah, I mean, but most people do. So if you have all your friends over and there's kegs and bartenders and mixed drink and all the kids are, you know, playing football outside, they see you drink, so they think that's normal. Right. And then, yes, for, for those of us that have uh, addiction in our genes, you know, I've interviewed hundreds of alcoholics and addicts, uh, it is not uncommon at all for, for that person to say, I knew I was an addict the first time. Uh, uh, or agent time I got drunk as and they knew from that point on that the, that light switch was turned on so if they see you uh drinking you know every super bowl every sunday brunch uh every birthday every time you have friends over it's it's likely they're going to do the same thing and then and then next thing you know we're we're talking about um recovery from them instead of for them instead of prevention Yes, okay. You know, I just looked at an issue of uh, U.S. Magazine, and I opened, to uh, a, uh, I, I opened to a page showing everyone holding a glass of wine or alcohol, and the caption was, Wine Down Time. <laughs> so the media yeah. and advertisers have been promoting a culture of abuse of all kinds, verbal, sexual abuse, uh, lack of respect for family values for such a long time. And the thought, I hear people say this, anything goes, which is, of course, not true, has become the mainstay of our personal attitudes and behaviors. And that idea has to change for the many ills of our cultural decline to change so this is something people have got to become aware of how we're, it's being promoted all over and find ways that they can do what's good for them despite that promotion so despite the volume of accumulated medical knowledge about alcoholism many still think it is a choice when does it stop being a choice well, it's certainly a choice to start or not. Let's let's start with that. So, if uh, like billions of people in this world, ne if you never have, if you or your child never has a drink or a drug, you know, there's entire countries that that ban alcohol and drugs. If you never have a drink or a drug, then then it is a choice, and you will not become an alcoholic. That's 100 percent. But if you go from wanting a glass of wine after work to needing a glass of wine after work. Bad news is one never knows. When you become an alcoholic or an addict, when you actually transition from a normal drinker to an alcoholic, it's not like there's a bright light test. What I can tell you, it's generally when you change from wanting a drink or a glass of wine after work to needing that drink or glass of wine after work. Alcoholics, once we become alcoholics or drug addicts, we actually have to have our, our brain tells us we need a drink every night or every day or every four hours. Um, so it's not that we, we go home and we, we want the wine. We go home and we have to make up an excuse to find the wine. Yes. 
Well, according to the dictionary, an alcoholic is someone who uses alcohol to excess and becomes addicted to it to the detriment of their health and well-being. You write in the book, Mark, doctors, politicians, teachers, and addiction specialists have been talking about drug and alcohol addictions for the last hundred years, even at one point legally banning alcohol. And yet the epidemic is getting worse. From one generation to the next, the cycle of addiction worsens. Now, tell us what an addict is. An alcohol is someone who has to use alcohol to excess and then becomes addicted. So what is an addict? It's an addict, and it can happen very quickly. It can happen within like 72 hours. Um, uh, an addict is, is when, when your brain tells you you need that pill or that drug, and you have to have it. And if you don't have it, you start to feel sick, and, and your brain starts to, to obsess about that. So, um, you know, if someone takes a, a pill or a Xanax or something at, at a party, uh, they might be able to not take it the next morning. They might get addicted, but they might not. Um, someone who has reached into addiction, and it might be in less than a week, you know, as soon as that substance wears off in their body, the Xanax, for example, that they're craving another one, and they can't think about anything else. So the addict, it's uh, it's that they they can't avoid taking it. You know, you give some very good facts in the book. By the age of 13, most kids are exposed to an opportunity to use alcohol or other addictive substances, and they may fall prey to it. And then more families have members with alcohol abuse than we might think. You give, you say that 30% of Americans have dealt with alcohol abuse. And it's estimated that 1 in 12 have, have a substance abuse problem. And half of all children of addicts become addicts themselves. And that could be because it's a gen, genetic predisposition. And they've just seen that lifestyle and they know uh, nothing else. That's all they know. Now, children of an alcoholic are up to eight times more likely to become alcoholics than are the children of non-alcoholics. So that's because it could be a genetic predisposition, right? Yeah, it's it, 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 certainly the the um, the statistics are overwhelming. It's it's without question if you have a parent or a grandparent that was an alcoholic or an addict, you are much more likely to become an alcoholic or an addict. You know, well, cutting it down, you know, in more detail than that, whether it's a, a genetic predisposition, they have found uh, a DNA that they believe uh, leads to it. But you're also right. If you're raised in an alcoholic household, uh, it's going to be dysfunctional. You're not going to have coping skills for your emotions, most likely. There's going to be trauma, and you're going you're gonna to see your parents drink. So it's, it's certainly a combination of both. Uh, but it's the the there's no, the what studies are overwhelming that if you have um, you know alcohol alcoholism or addiction in your past you're much more likely to become one yourself. Well, let's let's say this to our listening audience. You know, at the present time, we're seeing people addicted to many different things: social media, eating, binging, shopping, gambling. It's all over uh, the television. And media, and they're all symptoms of an unhappy state within, or low self-esteem, or confidence, and an, and an inability to recognize that they're using repetitive forms of behavior as an escape. Now, every one of us is dealing in one way or another with a challenge. So it's, for some it's alcoholism, for some it's binge eating and bulimia and other things. But addiction, unhappiness, suicides, I think they're happening more and more now because there's a general social decline at an all-time high. And the real problem seems to be we're not teaching our children an awareness of who they are and how wonderful life can be when they love themselves, trust themselves, ask for help, and have a more metaphysical approach to understanding spiritual life as well as physical life. Like you said, your first uh, counselor, you know, told you you were guided to do what you're doing. You didn't yeah. find it necessarily on your own, but you found it through a challenge that you had. 
So our culture is promoting this violence, abuse, and the theme that we're entitled to everything we desire and immediate gratification. So we've got to be aware of this. We have to talk about this. And we have to truly love people no matter what trap they fall into and help them to pull themselves out. Right now, the biggest thing is toxic masculinity. Have you heard about that? Yeah. I have. The media is now, this is the new thing, 50% of the world has toxic masculinity. Now, if you think about things long enough and concentrate on them, you make them real. So we want to concentrate on ways that we can help our children and our communities uh, to live a happier, more productive life. So let's go on to... um, Mark, you know, many people think of alcoholics or addicts. We tend to think of people whose lives are unproductive, people who may live on the edges of society. Yet you were very successful, and I know very many successful people who were alcoholics and were still drinking. How did you manage this, and how common is it? Yeah, well, there's there's also a high correlation of uh, very gifted people. Yes. With uh, without being becoming alcoholic, uh, so some of the same uh, some of the same traits in your brain that can make you very good at business or very good at art or uh, uh, you know very good at uh, sports um, can also lead your brain to uh, to become an alcoholic. So that's you know you see examples of that everywhere. Um, you know, functioning alcoholic is is sort of a misnomer. Because what happens during alcoholism and addiction is you get worse over time. So every alcoholic gets worse over time. Every year you're worse. Um, so what if I was quote functioning at the beginning of my disease? That just means um, you know I was I was really talented. But by the end of the disease, that talent was was still there, but it was 50% of what it used to be because I was concentrating on being hung over and drinking all day. Yeah, so, you, were, you were frittering away your energy. We all have yeah. so, only so much energy, and if we, if we don't use it in the direction we want, it gets wasted. Now, you said in the book, what if during my college years I had been told I had a fatal disease and couldn't drink alcohol like a normal college student? So what would you have done? That's told. why I wrote the book. Right. I don't know what I – I don't know why – what I would have done, but I do. I did know from my first week in rehab that I sure as heck wanted my kids to know this and have that choice. So my daughter, who's a senior now and applying to colleges, I have no doubt that she knows the potential downside, whether you know if she drinks or not. I, you know, that's up to her now. She's 17 years old, but at least she knows. She understands, a, a, right? She understands. You've and given has a other knowledge, the disease. Right, you've yeah. given other knowledge. So when are kids old enough to talk about alcohol and drugs? What's the best age to begin the conversation? You know, unfortunately, that, that age is going down because the studies and the evidence shows that the, you know, the, the first use of drugs, alcohol, and now vaping, uh, you know, vaping machines, cigarettes, uh, are oh. going down. So we're recommending now middle school, sixth, seventh grade, um, start reading our book. And by the way, we give them out to schools or anybody that needs them. This is a this is a nonprofit. Um, whether it's our book or it's parents talking to them, or it's uh, or the teacher talking to them or before they have that first drink or drug or cigarette or vaping or or, or vape. Um, so sixth and seventh grade. Great. And I just wanted to put uh, something in here. You know, I, I heard President Trump say more than once. And on different occasions, uh, that his brother had died from alcoholism, his older brother, and his older brother <clears throat> made him make a promise to him that he would never take a drink, and yep. and he never has. And you see him drinking diet coke; he likes that, but not alcohol. So uh, well, we can be told example. by it is a great example, and it can be given by someone we love who we have seen suffer, and then we know, and we can be strong enough not to follow the same path that they did. So I like that story. So what are the signs for kids or parents to see a problem at home? Leanna wrote this. She wrote, 
During the years of my dad's drinking, my parents would often fight. The words they would scream at each other would replay for hours in my head, and the sounds would echo in my mind until I fell asleep. I would often pray that my parents would find happiness and that God would blanket our house with his care and make the fighting stop. I thought that was a very um, telling passage from a yeah. child. That yeah, she's she's very uh, loves. insightful at her age. Yeah. And if I ever when I ever uh, if I ever have any urges to drink, it's good to read that because that's very <laughs> that'll, it's that'll punch a parent in the gut. Yeah, it's um, beautiful. You, you know, the signs are, um, you know, I, I like to say when you think there's something wrong, whether it's an employee or a child or a wife, when you think there's something wrong, usually, you know, the our, our first... Uh, uh, a gut yeah, feeling. Our, <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you have a gut feeling, most people just say, ah, forget it, I'm just being paranoid. Most no. people say that in almost every situation. When you see signs of, and you think, ah, oh, he seemed drunk, he seems weird, the, she's distant, the teenager's, you know, staying out late, smells. Uh, when you think there's something wrong, there's probably something wrong. You know, yeah. obviously, there, there's telltale signs of uh, drug use, dilated pupils, or red eyes, or sleeping a long time, mood changes, alcohol, you can smell alcohol. But I like to tell people whether it's uh, uh, your sister, your daughter, your son, your coworker, when you think there's something wrong, there probably is. Right. And then you have to try to talk to them and tell them it's all right to ask for help. And you gave some other signs that that children or anyone might see. Do your parents fight about the amount of alcohol or drugs one of or both of them are using? Does either of your parents drink or use drugs every day? Has either of your parents been arrested for a DWI? Uh, has your mom or dad lost a job because of drug or alcohol use? And does your parents' drinking or drug use result in odd or bizarre behavior? Now, I've seen all these things with different yeah, people. And yeah. as an intuitive, uh, I know, I know when a person's dealing with a complicated, painful issue, and yeah. and we can only offer help and then wait for them to reach out. It's very hard to get someone to do something if they have not yet decided that they want to. You can keep trying. Uh, but they eventually have to find it themselves. But let's get on to another serious issue that's going on in our culture right now. We are watching as marijuana is being legalized in many states. Let's discuss this very disturbing phenomenon. Uh, Mark, you addressed this this situation by saying our country is in the midst of a troubling trend of legalizing marijuana. And on January 1, 2018, California became the largest state the latest and largest state to make recreational use of marijuana legal, along with Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, soon to be New York, as legal as alcohol. So what do you want to say about this? You know how I feel about it. Well, look, <laughs> let me start with a study that came out on CNN, a big study that came out today. I read yeah. it on CNN. I read the study. A long t- a long term like clinical high end study has proven that teenagers that smoke pot get dumber. They mm. lose an average of eight IQ points in their thirties. Okay? So th- there's as of today, there's some statistical proof that you get dumber when you smoke pot. And I've seen that. I also believe it's the ambition killer. Yes. Okay? And I've seen it myself in hundreds and hundreds of people and friends where you might you might have the the most ambitious teenager who wants to change the world become a uh, surgeon and serve people uh serve homeless communities in Africa and they start smoking pot and the next thing you know their favorite thing to do on a Thursday night instead of study is get high eat pizza and watch Netflix and yeah. they don't stop so i call it the ambition killer it ruins your brain it's uh it's just sad that we have these companies out and, there. And there have been studies that show that it leads to usage of other oh, alcohol without drugs. Question. Without question. But they're telling you, you know, I was at a, a Christmas party, and there were four <clears throat> young women I spoke to who have, you know, teenage children. 
and I wanted to hear what they said about this. You know what they said? All four of them at different times. They said to me, well, it might be better than alcohol. And I no, said, it's no, not. it's not. It's probably even worse. <laughs> it, it's much worse. And I'm an alcoholic. That it almost Alcohol almost killed me. But alcohol did not destroy my brain like right. marijuana did. All right. Um, you know, he has, a few he has a few statistics to bear in mind. In Colorado, yeah. the Colorado Children's Hospital, this was in your book, saw a 400% increase in marijuana-intoxicated teenagers after legalization. The U.S. government, via its National Survey on Drug Use and Health, in 2013 found that people addicted to marijuana are 300% more likely to become addicted to heroin. Yale researchers found that individuals who used marijuana in the past were 250% more likely to abuse prescription pills than those who had not used marijuana. So I don't know how anyone, any politician, could stand up there because they want to make money and say that this can have any benefit. I, I, I mean, if it's medical marijuana, perhaps it, it serves a purpose, but not recreational. Now... I wrote in my book, we, we want, we're talking about finding peace and happiness in life, and none of these things will do that for you. In my book, The Living Spirit, I wrote when asked, how can I find peace and happiness in my life? And the answer I give is, before there can be peace and happiness in a person's life and in the world, every person must be responsible to do their own work about acknowledging what needs to change within their attitudes or actions so they may better relate to the outer world. Finding true happiness and joy is the natural outcome of self-investigations. There are no shortcuts. No one can make you happy or unhappy unless you give them the power to do that by surrendering or giving your own power away and you sort of said that before right you realized yourself that, that sounds like that's, that sounds like the uh the the authors of uh, the alcoholics anonymous book that wrote the 12 steps listen to listen to what you said because that's very similar yeah well, that's, a, a, because it's the truth it's the yeah. spiritual truth that we're here to experience some challenges physical emotional spiritual but we can, from within ourselves, change our perceptions, our thoughts, have more self-love, and, and find our way to help ourselves and not blame. Blame does nothing for us, absolutely nothing for us. So I want to thank you, Mark Treitler, for working to help others, and your daughter, Liana Treitler, who wrote the book with you. Avoid falling into a lifetime trap of, of alcoholism or any other addiction by beginning to recognize the behaviors and lifestyle that foster such action. We learn that everyone is constantly moving from the negative feelings of fear, anxiety, and pain and wanting to go to the positive spectrum of life, joy, happiness, and positivity. And every interaction in our life leads us to be part of that dynamic so when in pain and negative emotional states a person is susceptible to finding relief that is how an addiction is born for more information on this very challenging problem in our society go to potatoallergy.com in summarizing today's episode of healing from within we have only briefly touched on a very serious concern in modern-day American society. In a world where materialism and success is measured in monetary and socially accepted ways to relate to the world, our children are losing bits and pieces of their innate energetic or soul essence, which naturally knows that life is good and individual development of our personal needs brings joy and positivity and, and success on multi-dimensional spiritual and physical levels. We say we want our children to be happy, but then expose them to conditions, rules, and expectations for choosing friends, hobbies, work situations, and even how they spend their, spend their free time. In other words, our children are either living with parents who monitor their every action and control their very thoughts, or living with parents who have their own societal and emotional distresses and are not present at all. It is in helping all our citizens 
understand the nature of life and how to create a better life by their thoughts, actions, and behaviors that we may begin to understand how our emotional well-being is the key to avoiding or then conquering addictive behavior and can lead us to a path to prevention and creation of healthier ways to explore the human condition. It begins with education and our values, including an acceptance of people and allowing each of us to find our own path forward without so much judgment and restriction. Mark, Leanna, and I would hope you know that no matter how challenging your situation or problem may be, the first step on the road to knowing yourself and loving life begins with asking questions, observing patterns, building confidence, self-love, and before you know it, life will improve and there is a way past the darkness to light. I am Cheryl Glick, host of Healing from Within, and invite you to visit my website, CherylGlick.com, to read about and listen to visionaries, scientists, spiritualists, medical professionals, psychologists, attorneys, educators, and indeed people in all walks of life explore the physical aspects of healing and well-being. Shows may also be heard on webtalkradio.net and dreamvision7radio.com. Thank you.